sat down with a group of us and he looked at all of us and he said, so uh, I suppose you're all New Testament preachers. And, you know, we were. And he, an Old Testament scholar, said, uh, do you guys... Um, do you guys ever remember reading that the New Testament says that the gospel was first preached to Abraham? I had read that. And he looked at us and he said, I challenge you to preach the gospel out of the book of Genesis. So, on the way back somewhere in probably airplane time, I had lots of time to think, I thought about that, and I thought, you know, the gospel was first preached to Abraham, I ought to be able to find it. So I went back and I came back and I preached the Christmas story out of the gospel of Genesis, out of the book of Genesis. Isn't that, isn't that fun? I had so much fun that the next year I preached the gospel, I preached the Christmas story out of the book of Exodus. And that was so much fun that I Third, the third year after that, I preached the Christmas story out of the book of Revelation. Now, you know, you wouldn't believe it. It's all there. So I asked young uh, students, um, what is the gospel? And they'll say, well, it's good news. It's good news about what? And it is really interesting. I have tried this with professors theological professors. What is the good news? And it is amazing how we stumble and stammer trying to explain what the good news is. So let me just take you to the book of Genesis. <clears throat> the good news to Abraham was that he was going to have a son. That's the good news. Christmas is that story. A son has come. But what it is is life. Abraham saw nothing but a dead end. His life and Sarah was going to come to a dead end and there would be nothing beyond that. And God said, oh no, you have no idea. I'm going to give you a son and your posterity will be like the sand of the earth and the stars of the heaven. It's life. But you know, in the process of living life, there's a lot of stuff. So come with me to the book of Luke for just a bit here and let's pick up some of the Christmas story and, and I want to show you something. Luke, if you have a chapter one and I'm going to skip down through here because I, I want to come back and pick up other pieces of the story but this time uh, verses 5 and 7, 13 and 17 and then verse 25. You got it? Have you got the, get your Bible open? Stand with me, would you? Luke chapter one, verse five. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, okay, that gives us the date, there was a priest named Zechariah, okay, this gives us the setting, who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. Now, we can go back and we can know exactly every uh, group of priests, cohort of priests, had in a specific time, and once in their lifetime, they got to serve in the temple. So we can date this. This probably would have been about the month of May. So <clears throat> we, we can figure this out. There's a way to do this. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. So both of them were from the priestly tribe. Their pedigree. Verse 6. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren. And they were both well along in years. Wow. Sounds kind of hopeless, doesn't it? Let's skip down to verse 13. What do you do with verse 13? Here it is. <clears throat> but the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit 
even from birth, many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the and um, from the hearts of fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Man, what a passage. Skip down to verse 25. Elizabeth speaks. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor. Now, this is the, this is the phrase. And taken away my disgrace among the people. Father, you have preserved these words, and uh, they are powerful. And it gives a whole new meaning to Christmas. And there are so many people that feel this grace. We want any disgrace of ours to be taken away. And then we want to be able to share the good news in a way that others benefit as well. So by your spirit now, help us to understand something about this and to enjoy Christmas differently than ever before. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Okay. I come across people, and you do too, and everybody has issues. Everybody has an agenda. I'm finding an awful lot of blame today. People don't feel good, and so they blame. People are looking in all kinds of different places in different ways, but isn't it interesting how many of our people in our society today have some kind of reproach? They feel like that other people are putting them down or feel like that they have been excluded for some reason or other, a kind of disgrace perhaps. In Jesus' day, it seems that <clears throat> Jews had a criterion and they judged people. They felt that there were people who were excluded from the presence of God, access to God and his grace because of some conditions in their life. They thought that a Jewish man, for instance, who did not have a wife would be excluded from the presence of God. Or if a Jewish man uh, was married and did not have children, he would be excluded. So there, there is a reason for the sense of disgrace that we read about here. But now wait, before we judge them, how, how do we do? For instance, how do we feel about people who are sex offenders? How, how do we feel about drug dealers? How do we feel about ex-cons? I had a guy come to church one day, and I greeted him and asked his name. He introduced myself. He gave me his name, and I, I welcomed. He said, Pastor, you probably need to know I'm an ex-con. I said, oh, come on in, you're right at home. Let me introduce you to some other ex-cons. So I took him around and introduced him to a couple of other ex-cons, and I said, you know, at the foot of the cross, the ground is level, and everybody's welcome, everybody has a second chance. Wouldn't it be great to go to a church where, where you could feel at home regardless of what others thought of you or you felt others thought about you? And I, I think that the church honestly needs to be a library for sinners, not just a museum for saints. And there ought to be a way that people who need a Savior can come without fe feeling excluded or judged or something. So when I come to the Christmas story, I find in it a, the, the good news about acceptance. And I find a different kind of value. God values us for what we can be, not for what we have been. But in the Old Testament, there are some stories. There's, there's a lady by the name of Rachel. She happens to be <clears throat> the wife of uh, Jacob. And uh, the story is that Jacob had two wives. Now, you know, people weren't, they didn't have much sense back in those days. They had multiple wives. So Jacob uh, worked for seven years for uh, the privilege of a young lady's hand in marriage, and he was cheated and given the wrong one. He was given the older daughter instead of the younger daughter. But... But he loved Rachel. And uh, the story is that on one occasion, God 
God uh, heard her prayer and gave her a child. And she became pregnant and gave birth to a son and said, God has taken away my disgrace. Isn't that an interesting comment? Uh, we don't see people in the Bible who are included in the genealogy of Jesus as people who felt disgrace, but that's what they say. There's a second example that I have. The gal's name is Hannah, and she's a priest's wife. The priest is in the temple, and we read this. <clears throat> Whenever the day came for Elkanah, um, Elkanah to uh, sacrifice, and I say the A's in English there, <clears throat> he would give portions of the meat. There was sacrifice, and uh, some of the portions of the meat be by, by Old Testament command belonged to the priest to feed his family. So he would give portions to his wife, and uh, her, her name, Penina, or however you want to say that, Hebrew, uh, again, this guy had two wives. So this one got portions, and uh, she could eat from the sacrifices and also give to her sons and daughters. But then we read, but Hannah, to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her. Now what is he trying to make up for? Well, making up for something, and listen to this. And the Lord had closed her womb. I, I'm always interested in these kind of um, expressions. Now, you know, we, we sometimes read these kind of things in the Bible and we say, well, they were pretty dumb back there. They hadn't evolved very far. They had been just frogs very recently, and so they didn't know much. But we're so far evolved, we know so much better. We know that God doesn't close the womb. Those are just genetic things that happen. Oh, really? Do you know that in um, a typical <clears throat> cross-section of the number of children that are born, uh, there are about 51, 52 percent males and uh, 49, 48 percent females that are born, babies, just on a general average. But by the time they, the, the babies get to be about 40 years old, the ratios have reversed so that there's only about 47, 48 percent boys and uh, about 52, 53 percent girls. And I care periodically some wise guy will come along and say, well, there's a lid for every pot, you know, and every, every man, there's a woman, not necessarily. Mathematically, that's not true. Now, what's the difference? Well, boys are pretty reckless. They get on motorcycles and kill themselves and, you know, do all kinds of things. So this, you can see how this works. They go off to war. And so the ratio changes somewhere in life, and there just aren't enough men to go around. You know, some of you ladies know this, how this works. All right. Do you know in China they have been killing off the, the female babies for decades and they have a um, deficit of, of girls, of women, of marrying age and so they're having to import in China women as wives for the men. But you know that the uh, conception rate of males to females is, uh, is close to 90% today female babies are being conceived over male babies. Now, who controls that kind of thing? Is that just a coincidence of nature, or, or is there a divine hand in all this kind of stuff somehow? Okay, I can ask the questions. You, you come up with the answer. But I'm here. And because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her, so the other wife. And, you know, I, I can imagine that in those kind of situations there would always be some kind of rivalry. So I come to the gospel narrative in Luke, and Luke begins the gospel with the account of the birth of John the Baptist. Interesting place to begin. And he tells us that this priest and his wife, who both were of the lineage, uh, of priestly lineage, they had impeccable lineage. It says that they belonged to the priestly division of Abijah, and, and so we, uh, we get a a sense. You know, they were white-collar type people. And, and they were both genuinely religious. It says both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and regulations blamelessly. Wow, that's quite a deal. But they were living in disgrace. By that, we read simply that 
one of the wives, Elizabeth, did not have children. Elizabeth was barren. Oh, oh! by the way, they're both up in years, so the chances of having children now has dimmed and, and uh, highly unlikely. Now, we look at a story like that. For us, barrenness of children isn't necessarily it. Some, some, I find that a lot of people uh, have barrenness in the sense that they feel they've never led anybody to Jesus. And, you know, my life doesn't count for anything. I am nobody. I, I am no good. Uh, or it, it could be that we, we didn't have the privilege of an education. I, Karen and I went over to a conference in Seattle one day. Paul Yonge Cho was in a conference over there. He's the guy that pastors that Assembly of God Church in Korea that had 100,000 members. It's gone up to 500,000 now. It's just absolutely inhumane how many people pack into his church on a, on a weekend. Now, they're using Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday for all the services that they have to have. And, and you, have to, you have to have an appointment. You have to be assigned a number to be able to get in for worship. It's absolutely amazing. You have to pray so many hours before worship time. It's a fabulous concept. And they're sending out missionaries to China and all kinds of places. Anyway, I had heard about this guy and read about him, and then somebody had maligned him in a book, and I thought, no, I don't know whether that's true or not. I like to investigate things, so I wanted to kind of just sit at his feet and test his spirit and see if this guy was for real. So we went over there to a, to a conference and heard him. Oh, what a privilege. In the process, <coughs> Paul uh, Joe said, um, you know, I didn't have the privilege of an education like many of you have had. I, uh, I envy the fact that some of you have, have, have a seminary education. And so there I sat with a seminary education. He said, because I don't have the education that many of you have, I don't have a clue what I'm doing. So I have to spend two hours in prayer every day just for God to tell me what I'm doing, because I don't know. And I sat there and I thought, and we would trade a, 70, a seminary education for two hours every day with God, you know. But what, what I picked up is that, that he, uh, there, was, there was a sense in which he felt disgraced for not having had the privilege of an education. Years ago, I had the privilege of being included in a group of ministers driving down to Boise for a conference, and I don't know why they ask a young whippersnapper like me. They were all seasoned pre preachers, way older than me. But uh, six of us got in the district superintendent's car and drove down to Boise. And on the way back, they asked me to drive, because uh, I drive faster than most, you know, so I got the privilege of driving and driving this nice big Chrysler. <clears throat> And we were talking, and the district superintendent said, you know, I didn't have the privilege of an education like all of you have. I've always wanted a seminary education, never got one. And uh, so I feel um, inadequate around those of you that have a seminary education. You know, I had asked that guy for advice on several occasions, and he wouldn't give it to me. And I, I thought... What does he have against me? Why won't he give me advice? He has so much experience. And when I ask him for, from his experience to help me, he won't. And then, bingo, the light went on. He was throwing away his experience for all of my education. And I was throwing away all of my education for his experience. You, you know, we all do this. We have amazing ways of feeling some kind of disgrace that we don't have what somebody else has. But <clears throat> all of us has a, have a longing to do better, to do something, to be productive somehow for the kingdom. And here's the story, and it fits in the Christmas narrative, but disgrace is no respecter of persons. King David talked about and this must have been uh, after he had sinned, perhaps with Bathsheba, I don't know. My disgrace is before me all day long, and my face is covered with shame. King David, you're so talented. Then the Bible speaks of you in such a great epitaph that you led Israel with skill of hand and with integrity of heart. Why would you feel disgrace? But listen to what he says. A definition of disgrace is a state of being out of favor because of bad conduct 
or a sense of inadequacy. It, it's to feel unworthy. Now, there are lots of forms of disgrace, of course, and everybody has them. Some, some people have a handicap. Or uh, Years ago, there was a guy by the name of Don Duck here. Do you guys remember him? And, uh, you know, he would always keep one hand in his pocket. And uh, you always wonder, well, why? Well, one day he cut off two fingers under a lawnmower, and from then on he would never show that hand. You, you, you know, isn't it interesting? I had a, a guy I worked with, one of the greatest uh, administrators I've ever known. Worked uh, as he was a um, what do you call it? CEO of uh, a publishing house. And um, when he talked to you, he'd always have something in front of his face. He'd always hold a piece of paper or a book or something, and he always had it in front of his face. And I, I'm one of these guys that's curious about what, what, why in the world do you do that? What kind of a habit is that? Are you hiding something? So I watched very, very carefully. Took every advantage I could. He had a scar on his, on his lip, upper lip. And he had become conscious, self-conscious, probably as a kid, about that scar, and he always hid it. You know, it's amazing how everybody has some kind of a defect that they think is really important, and it, it becomes a kind of a sense of disgrace. Maybe it's just being different. I grew up in a different country. I was different color. My hair was different color. I, I felt an awful lot like this little ugly duckling here, you know? because I was different than everybody else. So Christmas is the message of grace to all who feel for some reason that they have disgrace. The message of the angels comes to the shepherds. Do not be afraid, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Well, man, would you think that if it's for all the people, maybe it's for some of us that feel disgrace in some way. So first I look at this passage and I would say, all right, the story of Christmas says that you and I need to experience the end of unproductivity. Now it may be not all of us are going to have children and not all of us are going to have a great company, not all of us are going to make millions of dollars or whatever else, but all of us can in some way be productive. And Christmas marks the end of our barrenness and that's what the story is. So what it comes down to is that we need to trust the God who has come near in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, it is an Old Testament promise, but it also involves a covenant relationship between people and God. So in the story of Elizabeth, the Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. But for us, you and me today, from the pen of the Apostle Peter. His divine power gives us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. And then down a couple of verses. If you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wow, isn't that, isn't that fun? I, I, I didn't write this, I just read it. And so a little pipsqueak like me that has a complex about spelling and all, all of these things that I've had to come through in my life, all of a sudden, everybody wants me to come. They want me to go back to Mozambique, Africa. I'm not sure I need to, but maybe I will need to. And they want me to go back to Guatemala. Just this morning, I opened my email, and sure enough, there's... A, when are you coming back to Guatemala? We miss you. We, we would like to have you come back. Would you come? Well, do I need to do that? But God, is, God has taken away my sense of disgrace. And, and now it seems that I have some value in his kingdom, not because of who I am, but because what he's enabled me to know and do and share and those kind of things. So what I read here in this story is that there was a boy, who, a son, who was given, whose name was John. Isn't it interesting that John means the grace of God? Just happened to hang a cute little name. Did you know that's what John means? No wonder there's so much grace here in our church. Yeah, the grace of God. Isn't that great? <clears throat> grace, grace. God's grace. <laughs> May grace increase. Okay. <clears throat> so serve God joyfully. Zechariah was serving God. He and his wife were doing all of the commandments. They're doing it out of, 
out of duty. You and I can do them out of love. And, and this new covenant that we can enjoy because Jesus has come to restore it has joy and enthusiasm to go along with our zeal. Man, we can be equipped with all. Stop questioning and blaming like Elizabeth did. The why, woe is me. I was communicating with someone yesterday. We're down in a deep hole, and, you know, life just isn't worth living, and I just feel terrible. And I said, God is greater than your feelings. Wrote back and said, well, wait a minute. Didn't God create feelings? Uh, aren't all of us supposed to have feelings? Yes, but my feelings don't trump the promise of God. Trust the promise of God over your feelings. So even if we don't feel at ease, God is greater than our feeling, and he knows everything. You know, there's a, there are times in life when I need that. So you and I need to quit chasing rainbows, searching for them, something to make us feel successful or feel good. How long will you people refuse to respect me? You love foolish things that you find in Costco and Walmart. <laughs> and you run after what is worthless. Brent and I stopped in looking for a cup of soup on our way home Thursday evening at Walmart. Man, people were dragging out two carts full of stuff in there like they had good sense. I told Karen, I said, I bet their garage is full of the stuff that they bought last Christmas, you know. <laughs> the second thing is... <clears throat> You and I have the privilege of, of experiencing the removal of this grace like Elizabeth did. So what I want to just say is grace, grace takes away disgrace. So receive the good news that God has come and that, sure, life isn't fair, but if we have him and he has come, we need him because life isn't fair, because we have done bad things, all of those things. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasure at your right hand. Now, that's God's promise, and it doesn't matter how I feel right now. This is what God promised that I can enjoy. Understand that God knows us. He knows how I'm put together, how you're put together. He knows what you've been through, where you're going. He knows what he wants to do with you, and he loves us infinitely. Real love isn't our love for God, but his love for us. God sent his son. That's what Christmas is all about, incidentally, to be a, the sacrifice by which our sins are forgiven. Wow. So you and I get to accept God's grace, which, incidentally, is available to change our life and fulfill our needs. Maybe not all of them instantly today, but you know it's amazing how God gives us the desires of our heart as we just journey through life obediently, faithfully serving him. The third thing is you and I get to enjoy God's gift of grace by resting in his love. Well, not always easy, but it's possible. Find rest, O my souls, David writes, in God alone. My hope comes from him. We can do it by listening to God's voice. It's the sound of silence. God never yells at us, but it's distinct. Zechariah heard God speak, and he knew that God had given him a specific promise. I'll bet he hurried home that day after work real quick. <clears throat> you and I can receive God's gift. Christmas, the greatest gift ever given. For this old couple, it was a boy named John the grace of God. For us, it's Jesus, the salvation of God. What a privilege. And so this is just a foretaste of what Advent is all about. We look forward again to, and we celebrate what God has done. And he has done these specific things for you and for me. John, come and lead us in a closing song, would you?